And I want to share with you, brothers, that we do not have to worry about not receiving resources or support from our heavenly kingdom because God, yeah. our king, promised that yeah. the gates of hell will not prevail over his kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. So when we're to go out, we're, we go with all the resources and all the backup from our heavenly father. We Amen. will receive his resources. Amen. Second, we must remember that Jesus did remove indeed all authority from Satan when he came to earth. Amen. He was crowned as the king in heaven so much that that oil of his crowning ceremony poured out to, him, to earth on the day of Pentecost in the form of the Holy Spirit. Amen. To empower you and me to carry on our mission as ambassadors of Christ. Amen. Now, this speaks of authority, right? Mm -hmm. This is authority and power. And why am I speaking these things? Many times I see all the suffering that is going on in the world, all the social changes that are occurring even in my lifetime. Morality is changing. <laughs> the, the new things that are happening all over the world, we have terrorist groups attacking all over the planet. Things are changing. But how, what are we doing as ambassadors of Christ? How are we bringing his kingdom and making it manifest here on earth? Amen. Now, just so that we are not accused of bringing in meanings that are from our time into a text that was 2,000 years old, what did a contemporary man to Paul, who wrote this letter, think about the word ambassador. And so we can see Philo, a Jewish historian who lived around the time of Paul, regarding the laws uh, to ambassadors, he says, in the, in the Greco Roman world, he says, the one sent out as an ambassador fully represented the originator of the message. He was the full embodiment of the sender's authority to the foreign nation. Did you catch that? He was the full embodiment of the sender's authority. Did you ever grasp that for yourself? Amen. Have you ever seen yourself as the full embodiment and representative of Christ? Amen. He gave us all authority, didn't he? Amen. I mean, the Bible says that we are sons of God. That's right. The Bible says that we are joint heirs with Christ, Romans 8, 7. In Matthew 28, he says, all authority has been given unto me. He didn't retain it. He said, here, I'm giving it to you. Go out there and make disciples in all the nations. Yeah. So the New Testament is full of these words of power and authority that were bestowed upon us. Now, I want to bring to notice something remarkable about this word ambassador. This word ambassador, which is our identity in Christ, it's very interesting. It comes from the word presbeuo in Greek, which means, does it sound familiar? From presbyter. It means to be an elder. To be an elder. Now, what is relevant about this? Paul, at this point in his life, he did not see himself as, he did not see, see ambassadorship as a role that he was doing. He saw it as something that he was. Let me explain myself. Now, when I say I am Colombian and Hispanic by birth, I cannot change that. I am always Hispanic and Colombian. It is the same thing. Once we're all members of Christ Church, we are ambassadors, whether we know it or not. Mm. But now that you're knowing it, I want you to embrace it Amen. and live accordingly. We are ambassadors in Christ's kingdom. Amen. Let us go turn to the Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 to 20. I want you to follow along with me in this process of bestowing ambassadorship upon us. The Word of God says, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 to 20. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Pay attention to that, a new creature. All things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. And all these things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. He reconciled us, we're many creatures, and then he gives us the ministry of reconciliation, verse 19, and he commits to us the message of reconciliation. After all this is done, listen, verse 20 says, now then, which means 
Therefore, as a result of these previous events that we have been made a new creature, we are ambassadors on behalf of Christ. Mm -hmm. Do you understand that? New creature equals ambassadorship. Amen. You are an ambassador. So we went from the position that we were, lost people in the world, to become an ambassador of Christ. Amen. Isn't that amazing authority and power that he has given us? Yes. So as, again, according to Paul, when we are forgiven, we're made into a new creation, given a ministry and a message. As a result, we're now ambassadors. According to Paul, he is an ambassador. Yes. Now, this is a, a statement of general fact. It doesn't apply to the pastor only. It doesn't apply to the elder. It doesn't apply to the bishops. It doesn't apply to the elders, the presbyters. It applies to each one of us. Amen. Just as the sun always shines, so we, when we're converted, are always ambassadors of Christ. Amen. Which means we have authority in this land Amen. to bring God's kingdom and make it manifest. You're given power and authority from God. Are you using this power? Mm. So yesterday I was driving the car as I was doing visitation, and I listened to this song. And this guy, in the song, Matthew West, he says, I was looking at the world and seeing all these things happening, and I shook my right fist to God saying, do something. What are you doing? Look at the bad things that are happening. And in the song, God responds to him. He said, I did something. I made you. I sent you go and do something. There's hungry people. Do something about it. <laughs> do something. We are his ambassadors. We have his approval. We have his authority. Let us do something. In Luke 24, 49, Jesus spoke that about the source of our authority. Where does it come from? He told the apostles, stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And he was speaking of the Holy Spirit. Because we must understand that that's where the power comes from. The Holy Spirit. And in Mark 16, 17, the word says, signs and wonders will follow those, will accompany those who believe. Are those signs and wonders following us as ambassadors of Christ? They ought to. They ought to. Oh Lord, let your kingdom and your glory be made manifest among your people. We need to arise to the challenge of being Christ's ambassadors. Now in the case that we may be uh, letting all this power get to our head, uh, we must also understand that in this very same letter, Paul Say something to uh, bring us back down. He says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So this power is only as we are in communion with God. As we are constantly connected with him. Amen. That is found in 2 Corinthians 5.7 for those of you who are taking notes. Now, second characteristic of the ambassador. We live in a foreign government. We live in a foreign government. So as ambassadors of Christ, we are representatives in a foreign land. Now, it may come to a surprise to you that it is not only me, a Colombian by birth, who am the one in a foreign land here. All of us here are peregrines in this land. That's right. All of us have a heavenly city, which has foundations made by God himself. Amen. So that is where our citizenship is. It is not here. Now, uh, just so that you know a little bit about myself, in the Army, my job is uh, called civil affairs. So I do everything that has to do with the civilian population who we are in the field. So in Iraq, after uh, Saddam Hussein was taken on power, we needed to rebuild a government, all the branches. We needed to build schools and hospitals and help the economy uh, their agriculture and all these things. So I will go around and do projects and hire the local population uh, to do all these jobs so that they can start growing into strong democracy. Therefore, they will not support terrorist groups right. because they will be taken care of by their government. Now, what is relevant here, I want to make two points. We are in a foreign land, right? We, are, we have our citizenship in heaven. Mm -hmm. So when we go to these missions, they tell us, and we are the experts. When I go to a place, I am the expert, more than the commander himself. I know everything that has to do with that country. 
I am supposed to be the expert. Now, they tell us something. They say, we're sending you over there. You, you learn the language, you learn the culture, you learn all these things. Just don't go native. You ever heard that expression? Don't go native? Well, they tell us that because they don't want us to lose our loyalty to the United States of, of America. They don't want us to identify ourselves so much with that country mm. that we lose our identity. Mm. And we are to do the same thing Amen. here with this ministry. Amen. We are Amen. called not to be removed from the world. We're called to let our light shine, as our right. sister shared right. today. But we're not called to become like the world. Amen. We're called to let the light shine in the world. Now, Paul does speak about this in this letter, and this is very uh, relevant to the message. He goes for five chapters in this letter, from chapter 2 all the way to chapter 7, and he shares about the credentials for his ministry. Because for him, for the ethos of the speaker, it was important that his life reflected the message. Because we're reading letters. That's why he understood uh, the message to me, which I will share with you later on. But... Paul goes on to say, after he clears all this out, he tells the people, he says, for what does light have to do with darkness? And he was speaking about them being married with uh, non-believers. He said, you shouldn't mix one with the other. Mm -hmm. that, that was his version of don't go native. Mm -hmm. Do not go native. Do not follow the customs of the world. Mm -hmm. Remember, you have a heavenly citizenship. Now, uh, we, are, we are called to uh, blend with the country. When uh, we're over there, a lot of times, we are not even in uniform. In my job, we go in civilian clothes. We don't carry weapons. We're risking our lives a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, we go because we're trying to make people comfortable. I bet you didn't know that, huh? There are soldiers out there walking in civilian clothes trying to uh, bridge that gap between the civilian population and the United States of America to present the good face of the United States out there in the world. So when we do these things out there, uh, we're supposed to blend with them, and we're supposed to be made aware of their needs. So we go around and we assess the needs of the communities. We have plenty of needs. This uh, opportunity here in Kingston for me was an eye opener. A lot of times I thought, I will need to go back to my country, to Colombia, because there are needs over there, and so then I can start ministers there. There are needs everywhere. Yeah. Here in America, your neighbor has needs. Yes, yes. That's why we must do something about it. That's right. Now, our third characteristic. We are on a special assignment. Now, this special assignment has two parts. One is the Ministry of Reconciliation. Another one is the Message of Reconciliation. I'm going to start about the message. I'm going to talk about the message first. Because this message is very interesting. There is power in the message. Mm -hmm. See, the Word of God says that, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. So the message itself has power. But there is something even more remarkable about this. In open your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. Look at what it says. It says, And all these things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. Listen to this. And he has entrusted unto us, as Paul and all believers, the message of reconciliation. Now the words here in Greek is temenos and hemin. It doesn't say he has given to us. Temenos, to give, and in, hemin, us. So he gave the message in you. He put mm. the word in you. The power is in you. Mm. He gave you the power. And that speaks of the transformational power of the word. We talked about the light earlier. Because when you receive the word, not on the ears, but in you, it will transform you outside out, inside out. Amen. And everybody will be able to perceive it. Are you letting the word of God do that transformation in you? Amen. Now, you have the power because it is in the Word, in you. And you also have the power because it is in these vessels that God places His Holy Spirit. So you have dual power. <coughs> and that's why we ought to allow the Holy Spirit to write letters of love to the world out there. So when people see us, they will see God's handiwork in our life. 
he's writing with his finger in your life, Sister Tina. He's writing with his finger in my life. And we all to allow him uh, to continue to do this work. Amen. Now there is also a power in the message because it is the will and by the will of God. The same verse that we just read says that all these things are from God. And what things is he talking about? Well, the things that he was talking about before, some verses before, and some verses afterward. In verse 14, it says that it is God who gives the ministry. Verse 14 to 15, salvation is from God. Verse 16 and 17, regeneration and sanctification are from God. Verse 19, it is God who justifies us through himself, uh, to himself in Christ. Verse 18, it is God who reconciles us to himself. Verse 20, it is God making his appeal through us. Verse 21, it is God who made Jesus sin for our sins. This means that you can never be more inside the will of God than when you're sharing the word of God, the gospel, the message of reconciliation by words and actions. Amen. You want to know if you're doing God's will? Share his message of reconciliation Amen. by words and actions. Amen. Characteristic number three is that the power, there is power in the message because it provides a fit solution for our predicament, for our problem. Now, there are a lot of uh, pastors out there, and mind you that I did come to Christ to start with, with a book called, uh, what's the name of the book? <laughs> it was a, uh, The Purpose Driven Life. The Purpose Driven Amen. Life. So, yeah. Purpose Driven Life. That started guiding my steps toward Christ. But that is not the gospel. If you believe that is the gospel, you're wrong. Now, see, some people are preaching, come to Christ and fix your marriage. But that's not our problem. Some people are preaching, come to Christ and start shooting better in the basketball court. Or come to Christ and get rich. That's very popular here in America. But that's not the problem as God sees it. What is the problem as God sees it? He says, uh, in uh, John chapter 3, verse 16, he says, for God sent his, world, his Son into the world, not to condemn it, but that the world through him may live and be saved. Now, the problem as God sees it is in John 3.16. Either we perish or we receive life. And God is telling us, you are at the brink of judgment, but I have a solution for your predicament. You set my Son, Jesus Christ, and his merits at the cross, and you receive life and eternal salvation. So the issue is God see it again is, do you want to die in your sin and suffer the second death? Or are you interested in a full and complete forgiveness and eternal life? That is the gospel. Now, another reason why this message is so powerful is because it is God pleading. It is God pleading. That's what the word says there. Let us read. It is as if God is pleading through us, we implore on behalf of Christ. Did you catch that? God as a beggar? God is begging through us, be reconciled with me. Do you ever catch that? Picture Jesus Christ speaking about Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, how often I wanted to gather you under my wings, yes. but you will not. God is begging with sinners. Yes. To me, that brought a lot of uh, feelings when I saw God begging sinners to save. That highlights so much how he respects our free will that he allows us to make the choice. He begs. He even begs so that we can be converted. But it is ultimately our choice to receive that salvation. Now there is also power in the ministry. Remember how I began the sermon saying that the message was not only about the message that we're to share with the world, but also about the reasons to do it. Even when we are discouraged, even when we are uh, suffering. Now some of the reasons to do it is because of the imminent judgment. Let us uh, go some verses prior here in the same letter, chapter 2. Corinthians 5, verse 10. Look at what Paul says that motivates him in his ministry. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, 
so that each one might be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Therefore, knowing that the fear of the Lord will persuade men. Do you love your neighbor? Amen. Warn him, there is judgment coming up. Amen. Do you love him? Let him know. There is a judgment coming up. But there is a way out of that judgment, right? For those who believe in Jesus are not condemned. Let me hear some amen. 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 For God has appointed a day in, he, in which he will judge the world in righteousness. And he has given assurance of this by raising Christ from the dead. As in the book of Acts, chapter 17. Now the impending judgment is a fundamental message of the Adventist church. We speak of the three angels message. The investigative judgment. The pastor will be discussing that this week as well. And even Jesus Christ spoke more about judgment and hell than any other Bible writer. Did you know that? Because the gospel and judgment go hand in hand. You cannot have one without the other. You have to be aware that you're a sinner at the brink of judgment before you can come to repent yourself before Christ, before his cross. And that is the message that we are to share with the world. Another motivation to remain faithful in sharing the word is the promise of eternal life and the guarantee that we receive through the Holy Spirit. On September 11 of 2012, Christopher Stevens, the United States Ambassador of Libya, was killed in Benghazi. There has been a lot of political turmoil of what was going on. I will not get into that. There is one thing that we should all remember. Christopher was killed while serving as an ambassador for the United States of America. And Paul was such an ambassador, ambassador that he was willing to give his life for Christ's kingdom. And what is the thing that motivated him to do so? He said, uh, there is power to stay in the ministry in the promise of the blessed hope of the resurrection and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let us turn to chapter 4, verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Where Paul says, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Paul says, I like to hear those pages turning. That's nice. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, all of us have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Amen. And then he skips a little forward and he says, We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is not seen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Amen. And then he goes on to describe his weaknesses, feebleness and perils, dangers of the ministry. But then he turns back to say, and as a guarantee of this eternal life, we receive the Holy Spirit. It's a down payment <coughs> for the heavenly kingdom. Because he was, the, he was there, the anointing uh, element in the inauguration of Christ's kingdom in heaven. And that's why he anointed the, whole, the uh, apostles and all of us today to continue the ministry. So he had to remind them of the resurrection and the assurance of it <coughs> by the down payment of the Holy Spirit. That is also found in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1 through 10. And finally, the greatest motivation that we should all have. Yeah. It is love. Amen. And we find this in this very same letter there. Verse 14 says, For the love of Christ compels us. For the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, Therefore, all die. And he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again Amen. on their behalf. The message is clear. We no longer ourselves. It is Christ who lives in us. In the life that we now live in the flesh, we live by faith in the Son of God who died for us. Now, how did this law work? In Greek, is that there is very interesting the way they speak. Sometimes you can uh, see the words as referring to a subject or another subject. So when he says the love of God compels us, uh, I like to take it as a plenary genitive, which means 
which means the love of God coming from God, because the Bible says in Romans 5 8 that we love, uh, He loved us and he, uh, he gave His life for us while we were yet sinners. Yes. But the Bible also says elsewhere that we love Him because He first loved us. So yes. the, the way I like to see this is that the love of God coming from God compels us to love Him back again and love the brethren. So it is, it comes from God and then it returns to God as we manifest it to the world. Amen. So that's uh, how we ought to see that. It is a love that transforms. And I'd like to bring to attention that kings have given up their kingdoms in Europe for love. They were supposed to marry somebody to make alliances and they give it up for love. They say, I don't love that person, I will love for them. They have given up kingdoms. Uh, the other day I was watching on YouTube this lady, she was about 50 years old, and her son uh, was pinched uh, below the wheels of a car. And she came with a mighty strength, I don't know from where, and she was able to pull that car out until her son was able to come out. I don't know where she got the strength for, from, but it is love that caused that <laughs> manifestation of power. And it is the same thing for you and for me. We ought to allow Christ's love manifested in our lives to be reflected in the world. Go out there, search for the sinner. Go out there, search for, search for your neighbor who is in need. I would like to try something as we uh, remain reflective about our ambassadorship. And I, I would like everybody to close your eyes as you listen to the following words. And sometimes when I feel a little tired and I may not see the results that I expect, I hear these words of Christ speaking to me. I die for them. Those lost souls that you see in the world, won't you go and look after them? They were worth my blood, my blood. Are they not worth your labor? I came from heaven to earth to be a servant and to seek the lost. Will you not go as an ambassador to the next door or next city or next country to seek them? I emptied myself of power to do this, but it is your honor to be so employed as I invest you with power from on high. I will judge the world in righteousness. Will you not warn them? I have suffered so much for their salvation, and I am willing to make you a co-worker with me. Will you, will you take up that which rests upon your hands? I pray for the Father's kingdom to come to earth. And as we remain where we are, I would like to make a call for those of us who want today to live as ambassadors of Christ, to truly give our lives, to not live one more day thinking, what if I have given it all? Right. What if I just stop going through the motions? Mm -hmm. What if I have indeed given my whole for God's kingdom? If that is your desire today, I would like you to raise your hand. If you want to serve the Lord, I would like you to raise your hand. Now today, we also spoke about the message that we're to share with the world. You can put your hands down. And that message is that we are sinners in need of a Savior. We're in the judgment day, but the verdict need not be negative for you. So if today you are considering and you're hearing God calling you to give your life to Him, to receive eternal life instead of damnation, I would like you to come forward. I would like you to take that step of faith in front of us today and to give your life to Christ, that He may transform you and make you into a new creature, that He may make you an ambassador for His kingdom. As you enter His body, the body of Christ, through baptism, couple of weeks for when we will be holding the baptism. If that is your desire today, I invite you this time to come forward to give take this step as a testimony in front of all of us, that that is your desire to be transformed and made into a new creature, a creature with power from on high, an ambassador in 
God's kingdom. Let us uh, all stand up for a word of prayer. Father, your word has spoken. We are your ambassadors. Today, we have rediscovered this new identity in Christ. We want to live according to it, Father. So pour your Holy Spirit on us at this time, Father. Manifest his power and authority in our life. And let the transforming power of this spirit and of your word transform us. Father, we pray for those that are making a commitment to be the ambassadors of your kingdom. We pray for those that are making the commitment of coming to your kingdom through the pearly gates, Father. Coming to your kingdom through the water and the spirit through baptism. I pray that you continue to encourage them and to seal them for salvation. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us sit down.